All right, well, why don't we just go ahead and uh, get started so uh, Dr. Kennelly can get his presentation going. Um, good evening and welcome to the FPRMS Fellows webinar series. Um, this is a joint effort between AUG, SUFU, and SGS. Um, it's a wonderful learning opportunity and we are very grateful for their support. Um, I'm Amanda Merriman. I'm the first year fellow at Atrium Health in Charlotte and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, today's webinar is titled The Science of Graft Augmented Repairs, and it's being presented by Dr. Michael Canelli. Dr. Canelli is faculty for both the Departments of Urology and Urogynecology at Atrium Health in Charlotte, um, and he's also a world-renowned uh, specialist in spinal cord injury medicine. He's the medical director of the Charlotte Continent Center, the director of urology at the Carolinas Rehabilitation Hospital, and the co-director of the Women's Center for Public Health at Atrium. Our panelists, panelists today include Dr. Vincent Lucente um, from the Institute of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. Um, he's affiliated with the St. Luke's University Health Network in Pennsylvania. Um, we also have Dr. Peter Sand, who's from the University of Chicago North Shore Health System. Um, for the layout today, the webinar will feature a presentation for 30 to 40 minutes, followed by a panelist discussion revolving around a couple case scenarios and concept uh, questions. Um, we will We'll then open the webinar to questions from the audience for the final 15 minutes. Um, for some housekeeping, um, the webinar is being recorded and live streamed. All participants will be on mute, so please use the Q&A feature um, if you have any questions um, that you can direct towards individual speakers. Um, we'll try to address as many questions as we can during this hour. Um, please use the chat feature if you have any technical issues. Um, the AUG staff will be monitoring that and try to help assist if they can. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will also be asked to complete a brief survey and provide feedback about the session. Um, I also wanted to let everybody know that our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, June 9th. Um, it will be at 5 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be on the surgical treatment of stress urinary incontinence. Um, it will be presented by Dr. Uh, Mickey Karam, with the panelists uh, being Drs. Roger Jimachowski and Dr. John Gebhardt. Um, please visit the AUG's um, website to sign up for this. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Kanu. All right, Amanda, thank you very much. Uh, while I get the screen kind of set up here, so, all right, well, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance tonight. Thank OGS, SUFU, and SGS for putting this on. Uh, and really what we're trying to do is kind of talk about the science of uh, graft augmented repairs. The disclosures tonight, uh, you can see on the screen, are probably pertinent for some of the companies that are in the pelvic floor, Boston Scientific Coloplast, which I've been doing some uh, research and also some consulting roles. As that's been stated, what we've been trying to do is really talk tonight about some of the, the learning goals from female pelvic medicine, specifically to graft materials, kind of utilizing some of how the properties of graft materials, what some of their sort of surgical techniques of placement, and what the results have been. I think everyone on this call has really known about really the significant prevalence of uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And it's well known that up to 50% of Paris women over the age of 50 will have some degrees of prolapse, whether or not it's symptomatic or not. We do know that in the anterior compartment, it seems to be the most predominant at 34%, followed by the rectal posterior compartment. However, apical and combined aspects are about 18%. And really the lifetime risk continues to evolve, especially with the aging population. And it's been shown several years ago that we had over 300,000 operations per year for pelvic prolapse. However, our skills have evolved and gotten better, but unfortunately, we still have recurrences. And in fact, up to 20 to 40% of recurrences can occur within the native uh, tissue compartment. And most of the time it occurs at different sites and that can be very problematic. When you really look at why do uh, what presents people with increased failures. It's really the people that have, you know, prior failures in the past, people with chronic pelvic floor stresses, such as Valsalva, cough, exertional activities, people with pelvic floor neuropathies, patients who actually also have connective tissue disorders, patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have very sort of mobile tissues, and also body habitus, BMI, also contributes to it. When we look at why would you actually consider grafted augmented repairs? Well, clearly we're trying to improve the durability of our standard native tissue repairs. You know, they're good, but we know that we can do better. 
In addition, especially on the posterior compartment and other areas where maybe there's a defect in the tissue, there's a total tissue loss. If you have someone you're trying to really maintain a vaginal length and caliber, possibly a good apical support would provide that. In addition, patients who you're trying to have recurrent prolapse, you can't keep doing the same operation over and over. You need to change. So really, there's many ideal characteristics of the, the best graft. And one would be the, as listed here on the left. And I'll be honest with you, we just haven't found the ideal graft at this point in time. We've come a long ways, but we're really not quite there because we actually need something that's more physiologic within the vaginal compartment. Now, when we look at different graft materials, they're really broken up into two different types. The biologic component, which is autologous and heterologous, and also synthetic component. Now, we've had some other lectures that have been here on synthetics. So what I'm going to do is kind of break off and talk about synthetics, but in a very superficial sort of quick fashion, spend most of the time on the biologic aspects. So when we look at synthetic graphs, we know, based on our experience, if you've been around, that mesh can become a mess. And really, why is it becoming a mess? It's really because the underlying properties within that graph material. And so we as surgeons and physicians need to really better have an understanding of why and what we're putting in patients. We also realize that we probably weren't educating the patients very well properly. But I think the other part is our execution of surgery really involves the dissection plane, the delivery of it, and also the setting as far as not too tight. Because the one thing you have to remember with any surgery is that the three Ps that determine success, there's the physician expertise part, there's actually the patient factors that come into it, but also product performance. So what we're looking at right here today is really to talk about the product performance synthetic, but remember those two other aspects are really critical. So the ideal vaginal mesh, what we're trying to do is maintain the physical characteristics, the supple nature, the distensible nature within the vaginal wall, basically simulating what natural tissue is. Now, we of course want it to be inert. We don't want to have any risk for infection, but it has to have the ability to stretch. We cannot have something that actually constricts and contracts over time. When we look at the various different synthetic materials out here, you can see that these are a variety that have really been in use, but each of them has their own distinct characteristics. And we know that based on the polymer, the weave, the filament, the pore size, what we found out over the last 15 years is that there's key factors of which pore size, the interstices are really key and also density. Now, the things that probably affect us is that really the weight, and that can be the weight of the individual fibers, but the weight of the whole total mesh amount. We clearly want a macroporous uh, property of synthetic material, which is polypropylene is the one that's been the best because it decreases uh, inflammation and improves ingrowth. But the interstices, we want wider spaces in between to allow the macrophages to get in place. So we've kind of known that. But what the science has shown that the heavier weight meshes, which we originally used, have a higher risk of extrusion. And so you want a smaller weight, sort of lighter weight mesh. We also want it that the lighter weight mesh allows the fibroblasts to actually do their job to the maximum. There's less fibrosis, less scarring, and there's better incorporation. And you see the pictures of below are really our meshes that have smaller fibers. They have lower weight within that area to allow also the movement. We clearly don't want to have contracture. Lighter weight meshes, it's been shown, have less inflammation, so there's less scar tissue that's being developed. Clinically, that can benefit patients having less sort of pain, discomfort, and pinpoint tenderness where the mesh is located. The other aspect of sort of heavier weight meshes, heavier weight meshes actually create a stress shielding response. Remember, as the bladder and people are moving, exercising, jogging, there's forces moved within the bladder on top of the vaginal area. And if you put a graft that is very thick and has less sort of flexibility, the forces within the fibroblast below it don't have the ability to react. And over time, the fibroblasts actually start to atrophy. And as they atrophy, they subsequently get thinner and you higher risk for exposure. So kind of where would I say we're at within synthetic material? If you look on the left, these are all the things where we're at today. I think we do have some good lighter weight meshes, but where we're really striving for the future is superior characteristics. 
What we really want is something that has physiologic loading that allows the vaginal air to be elastic. And that way you can have really a decreased risk of dyspareunia. But ideally we're looking for something that really can maintain the same properties that we have with the native tissue. The difficulty is we need to have data and data will be what's driving us. If you look here, this is the data from the 2016 Cochrane Review specifically regarding transvaginal mesh versus native tissue. Now there were several randomized controlled trials, 37 that were involved, but the data was only low to moderate when they looked at it. And when it all is kind of said, when they're looking at awareness of prolapse, repeat surgery, recurrence, transvaginal mesh was really associated with lower weights of awareness, lower rates of repeat surgery, and lower rates of recurrent prolapse. So from an anatomical standpoint, it actually was better. However, the difficulty, it has higher risk of uh, stress during incontinence development, higher risk of exposures, higher risk of bladder injury, and higher risk of complications. Consequently, for the first time repair, it was recommended not to be able to use synthetic mesh from transvaginal area. And obviously people have known too, from April, 2019, the FDA banned the sale of all transvaginal meshes. So that's kind of putting a, a sort of a, a package on the synthetics. What I'd really like to do the rest of the time is spend a little bit more involved in biologics because I'm not really aware that a lot of people have had a lot of experience with biologics. And so I wanna go a little bit more detail. Within biologics, you see here that it really branches off into allografts, which is human tissue versus xenografts. And you can see that even within that area, there's autologous and donor within human tissue and xenografts from a variety of animals. So there's multiple different areas that come into play. Historically, what your gynecologists and urologists started was using autologous material for slings. We used autologous rectus fascia, autologous fasciolata. Most people used the rectus fascia because it was easier to, to get to, simpler. The benefits obviously are listed here. There's no risk of erosion. There's good incorporation, but the difficulties are people are having higher morbidity from incisions, they have seromas, and higher risk. And so as age goes on, what we tried to do is say, can it be better? And consequently, that's when we started to look at, could we use fascial slings from other tissues? Now, before we get into that, the thing that I'd like you to remember is that all of these type of graphs, biologic, are really scaffolds. And what a scaffold is, is just as part of a building block. And remember, all of them are really looking at the extracellular matrix, which includes collagen, fibronectin, laminin, in addition to glycosaminoglycans. And these are all critical components. Most of us think of it's just the collagen, and there's typically type 1 and type 3. Type 3 collagen is actually the immature type collagen that has the ability to form good collagen fibrils into type 1. Scar tissue typically is mostly all type 1 collagen. But the thing about it is you need the other support structures to kind of build a very good home. And what we're really trying to do is develop within these scaffolds is that they are sort of the, the building blocks. They're the frame. If you think of building a house, it's the frame of the house. But in order to really build that house out, you need to have rooms in that house, which is two by fours. You need to have drywall. You need to have various different rooms, but then you need to have within the host, you need to have people come and live in that house, put in furniture, put in pictures on the wall and really make it a home. So the point is these scaffoldings are just the frame. They need these other two components with host cells, they need host tissue, they need the other areas to really make them thrive. So what really happens when you put in a biologic graft, if you do any type of surgery, well, it goes the same pattern of the healing process. So whenever you have a trauma or an incision, you're getting host tissue events that right away you're gonna get bleeding, you're gonna get platelets driving in hemostasis. And that will really drive the neutrophils to come in that are kind of the scavengers to clean up originally to make sure there's no antigens. But soon after that, within minutes and within days, you're getting macrophages to come in. Now there's two types of macrophages, M1 macrophages that are sort of pro-inflammatory. And then there's later on, after they've been cleaned up, M2 macrophages, which are pro-remodeling. 
And what you're really trying to get to is that pro remodeling because the macrophages type one have a higher risk for performing scar tissue. And so this process of integration within getting new stem cells within that area and proliferation will eventually lead along with the degradation of the scaffolding, hopefully to a remodeled form. And so the thing that we do know is in pelvic prolapse, we're kind of looking at strength. And with synthetics, we've been able to show that over time, the strength of the synthetic has been stable. But when you're using a biologic, a scaffold, the scaffold itself, you know that it's going to fade away over time. The issue is you don't know the degradation sort of speed at which it's happening. And then you also don't know the regeneration ability for which the new cells, the host, and the tissues are coming in play. And so the real caveat, the real issue when using biologics is there's a gap. The gap is basically the time for which the scaffold sort of degradates and you're losing your strength before the remodeling occurs. And what we're hoping, I think the best graphs in the future will really bring that gap together and so that you can have the continued support throughout while the remodeling regeneration occurs. So when you look at the different materials, they come from all different sources, not only different sources which make an effect, but they also come from different types of material, whether that's dermis, bladder. In addition, the stages, fetal tissue actually has more type three collagen. It's got more extracellular matrix material within it that's better than adult type materials. But then the real factor is the proprietary processing, which is called decellularization. It's basically taking the tissue and how can you take that tissue, get rid of the DNA, the RNA, the cells that were within there, but during that decellularization process, how can you salvage the rest of the area? For example, in the, in the house analogy, if you're sort of being evicted from the house, some decelerization process would tear down all the walls and the only thing you'd have would be the frame of the house. What you really want is have everything left inside that house that can really build the remodeling package. And the difficulty is we have no standardization regarding the decelerization process within tissues. And three different things can really occur from biological graphs. The top is what we really want. That's basically when the material itself has all the cells removed, it's in great format, that it really pulls in the host tissues and provides a good nest. So revascularization, repopulation of cells, and then allows integration. What we don't want are cells that if they've actually had sort of uh, injury during that decellization process, that our bodies re reveal that it's basically foreign objects and it starts the inflammatory response, the M1 macrophage response continues and that resorption material and they get promotion of scar tissue with resorption. And then the other component is if the body just says, you know what, I'm gonna wall it off and create just a foreign body response and encapsulation. And we know that cross-linking materials like collagen actually provides more of a foreign body uh, encapsulation response. These are three different pictures that you're seeing here. The one on the left is sort of what's happening after, 30 after three months in a, in a primate model after looking at what's been going on. So after three months time, on the left, you're seeing sort of remodeling. You're seeing blood vessels that are coming into play. You're seeing some uh, natural tissues, some fibroblasts in play, and it's sort of distributed throughout. In the middle slide, which you're seeing at three months, is really a, a lot of inflammatory cells are still there with uh, PMM neutrophils. You're also seeing some of the degradation. This sort of biologic certainly has its ability to degrading. And then you're also getting more collagen fibers that appear to be more in a haphazard format. On the right, you're looking at a graph that actually is uh, cross-linked, which you know sort of makes that graph impermeable. You can see on the far right, the matrix is still present at three months. You're seeing inflammatory cell with neutrophils, and you're starting to see another fibrous scarring that's current on the outside. And so materials can really act in three different ways. Now, I think something that's really important regarding biologics is that allografts, human tissue, which is fascial auto and dermal derivatives, are regulated by the American Association of Tissue Banks. And consequently, their instructions for use is really for any 
type of reinforcement repair of soft tissue. That's it. That is their IFU. On the other hand, xenografts, which are listed here, are rated as class two medical devices. And consequently, they have to have a specific instructions for use and an IDE, and specifically for pelvic prolapse repairs, urethral support. And so every one of the materials down below had that at one point in time. And that's a big difference. So historically, these are majority of the, the products that we've been using. You can see either the animal source is different, but it's been mainly from dermis, fasciolata, and porcine dermis. The difficulty is that once the FDA banned all transvaginal meshes in April of 2019, xenografts, because they are considered a medical device, a class two device with synthetic mesh, it basically got thrown out uh, with the bathwater with the baby. Consequently, the only thing we currently have available is allografts, human tissue, either fasciolata or dermis. So let's kind of go into a little bit of what happens. What are they doing for these uh, patients that we're using the grafts on, the processing? Well, the tissue banks typically, number one, the patient has to say they're a donor for transplant. Once they're a donor, the, the companies of which there's over 50 tissue bank companies that do this type of processing, they try to look at the medical records. They wanna make sure that they screen the donor for the virology that you see here, looking for AIDS, hepatitis, and other factors. And they also will review the medical record. But remember, if you're using donor tissue, it's aseptically clean, cleansed. And so they remove the top part of the dermis, they're removing the cells. But in order to do that, they have to use a lot of antibiotics. You can see the host of antibiotics that are done here. In addition, they're using other chemicals with polysorb 20, DNAs, RNAs, that are trying to leach and scrub and strip those cells out. In addition, they may have some of the contents of the residual scrubbing and uh, areas left within the tissue. And then some products use low-dose gamma irradiation to try and sterilize that at the end. And that may or may not affect the collagen area. There's one product that's out there, Alloderm, actually doesn't have any sterilization to it at all. And so it's only aseptic. So things that you have to realize too is that patients may have a hypersensitive response. They may have allergic immune response, not only just to the, the tissues and the regions that are there, but it may also be to the antibiotics. And that's really critical. So some of the remnants that are there, acetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, may actually cause irritation. And so these products may have an immune response, they may have seroma development that can be problematic. The other thing that you need to remember is that these tissues are FDA regulated and so they have a chain of command. The tissues are under lock and key, they're in the refrigerated area, and that when the nurse takes it out, they have to know who the chain of command they're handing it off to. And there will always be a registry regarding these products going forward. So there's a lot of criteria that's involved. The other thing that comes into play is when you're starting to hydrate these. So different products have different hydration methods. And you need to know that from surgery because fasciolata, it's up to 30 minutes. You know, if you're waiting for the graft, that's a lot of wasted time. With dermis, for some dermal products, it can take it up to 30 minutes, but some are quicker at 10 minutes. But the thing you should also remember about dermis, human dermis, remember on the picture to the right, they peel off the top epidermal layer, but they leave a basement membrane, this yellow part. And so there's a sidedness to the tissue. And you know the sidedness by the dermal surface will actually absorb the tissue, absorb blood. And so you dip the blood to make sure it absorbs. And you consequently want to make sure you put that side on the vascular side of the graft. And that's really important to be able to do. So let's talk about a little differences between fasciolata and human dermis. One thing about fasciolata is remember the collagen fibers are parallel. And so the strength is different on, but depend on the direction that you're at. So if you're using it for slings, most people will fold over the end or double it over to be able to put their sutures in so they don't pull through. Fasciolata doesn't usually have a large enough graft for pelvic prolapse. When you're using human dermis, we like that because it's omnidirectional. The collagen fibers are in all different areas, so the strength is actually better to that location. But remember, it does have that basement membrane for sidedness. 
well, what's the difference between human dermis and sort of animal dermis? I think there's a lot. So here with animal dermis, it has a consistent thickness. You can get it in either one millimeter, two millimeters, or three millimeters, whatever you want. It's consistent throughout that whole area. And consequently, that will resist suture pullout. Remember that human dermis is undulated. There are some thick areas, there's some thin areas. And if you look at the, the range of it, they'll give you a range. They won't say it's a set thickness. In addition, most of it's with adult older skin, which as we talked about before, younger, younger tissue sources have actually better constituents for uh, acellular membranes. The other aspect is with uh, dermal tissue from xenografts is that they actually don't have basement membranes. So you can put this in on both sides. Remember, you want the, the tissues, the cells to get into this scaffolding so they can start getting a process. The hydration time is quicker, usually less than two minutes with certain uh, xenografts. You can store them at room temperature. They're all sterilized, just like your surgical instruments. Consequently, they don't have to go through the, the aspect of uh, tracking like a tissue bank. Now, one of the newer scaffolds that's been uh, coming around is really using small intestine submucosa and porcine urinary matrix. The area about this that's unique is that they basically, their decellularization process is a gentler process. They're not having to strip it, so they're keeping hold of a lot of the constituents with inside. On the flip side, the scaffolding sort of goes away within three months. And so are you really trying to use integration of some scaffolding versus regeneration? That graft I showed that talked about the grafts going away versus the remodeling, you know, it's the gap in between. And I think this is a great regeneration remodeling aspect within this. In addition, you can layer this type of variable, whether it be one ply, four ply, six ply, or 10 ply, the more layers you have, the thicker that they'll be for the initial strength, but it will sort of go away within that three month time period. So let's switch a little bit to the surgical techniques. Initially, when we did biologic graphs, this has evolved over the years. And this is a picture from actually a, a textbook. You can see here that the graphs were just sewn to the fascia, the endopelic fascia, you know, right towards the bladder neck. And you see it's anchored proximally to the endopelic fascia and just the cycle cardinal ligaments. Well, as I look at where they're attached, this is still a stage two prolapse. This isn't gonna make anything better. The graphs are just not to any anatomical structure. So what we've really learned over the years is we've got to put the graphs just like we do. If we're gonna do a sacrospinous fixation, we should go to the sacrospinous ligament. You know, if we're gonna do a sacral calpexy, we should go to the sacrum. So using fixated areas, the arcustaneous fascia pelvis is a perfect location for the graphs to be able to put in place. And as you can see here, it's evolved now that people are fixating it to key important structures that don't fade away. So if you're looking on the anterior compartment, you really wanna look at the cardinal sacral area or the cervix if you're using that, sacrospinous ligament and the, the arcustinous fascia pelvis. On the posterior area, those same components, but really bringing it down to the perineal body. The other thing to remember is when you're making your incision, when you're using synthetic material, it's really key to do a full thickness and not a split thickness dissection. But when you're using a biologic, a split thickness dissection is okay to use, but, and that may be to your advantage, especially if you're gonna use this in someone who's already had a mesh-based type of repair. Now, the difficulties with biologic is you have to go back to like origami. Most people in the anterior compartment at the bladder neck use a three to four centimeter wide area and towards arcus to arcus at the ischial spine or the sacral spine is 10, 11 centimeters. This area here on the top left would be sort of a, a level uh, two support. You're seeing at the bottom, they have some attachments that go down towards the sacrospinous. There's a variety of methods. In the area that you're seeing here, this would be sort of a, a four point fixation sacrospinous, uh, sacrospinous, excuse me, sacrospinous, sacrospinous, ischial spine, ischial spine, and bladder neck. And this would be the posterior compartment. So, once it's done, most people do the standard dissection, put the sutures and the sacrospinous ligament on both sides, utilize a pulley stitch. I prefer using at least a permanent suture proline in addition to one PDS 
a long acting suture that can actually go through and through the vaginal cuff to be able to bring that to give maximum apical support. Uh, once that's in position, you're trimming your graft from width to width. One thing that I would say is really important to, to remember is that granted from ischial spine to ischial spine is probably about nine to 10 centimeters. You want your graft to be either spot on or a little bit smaller. Remember, biologic graphs actually will stretch. They give way over time. They don't shrink like synthetic material. So you need your graph to be supportive at first and knowing that it's gonna loosen over time. And so trying to get the right fit is really key. Once the uh, apical components put in place, you put sutures also at the cervix area or uh, the cuff if you have it to elevate it. And then the job is to do some trimming at the bladder neck, but you do not wanna be tight on the bladder neck because you don't wanna sort of uh, elevate the urethra to cause voiding dysfunction. On the posterior component, it's a little bit easier because you're then attaching on the perineal body. And those are gonna be with absorbable sutures. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what is the evidence. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, meaning small case series retrospective, stating that people are getting good responses within the 85 to 90% success rate. But really, when you look at the Cochrane review that was done in 2016, there are only seven trials that used biological materials, and this was in the anterior compartment. And you can see here from the right, a lot of it was using materials that are not available today, Pelvicol, SAS, fasciolata. They, their attachment points were no sutures at all, attaching it to endopelvic fascia, attaching to arcus to arcus, so a lot of heterogeneity. But nonetheless, what they did show is that native tissue repairs increased the risk of recurrence and consequently, using biologic graphs, the recurrence rate with biologic graphs was 18% versus 28% with native tissue repairs. So there was some error there, but the level of evidence was low. Now, something more recent just came out with the 522 trial using a Zenform, which is a biological material. This is, once again, the 522 trial that was 228 patients in a prospective randomized trial. It's going through up to 36 months. They used a composite within the primary efficacy endpoints. This was presented at the FDA. Um, uh, it was an FDA meeting in 2019. You can see here their composite end form comparing native tissue versus end form. There's really no difference. However, they did present at that same meeting that although the data set wasn't complete, you're noticing here that there's starting to be a trend that the biological graft in the entering compartment actually is starting to be better than the native tissue. Now, I know that study is complete right now. We haven't seen the final data set, but it'll be very interesting to see what happens over time. So certainly it does show that uh, in addition to this trial, they had quality of life improvements that were comparable to native tissue at 12 months, and they did multiple quality of life improvement scales, even sexual function and PGII. They, there was only two graft exposures. They were uh, small, nothing had to go back to surgery. And in fact, the surgical intervention was higher in the native tissue uh, arm compared to the Zenform arm. So I think we'll be anticipated to see what happens there. But what about the posterior compartment? Well, it's been shown there's only been three studies of randomized control trials in this. They're once again, very low quality evidence. And really there was no conclusive evidence whatsoever that biological uh, graphs in the posterior air was uh, beneficial. But you can see here that all three of them attached it just to the levator antifascia. They did not attach it to the sacrospinous ligament, the arcus tendineus fascia pelvis. Well, what about the apical compartment, using it for a sacral culpopexy? There have only been two trials that have done 204 women. Congratulations to Pat Culligan because he's the one who's done in 2005 and 2013. He used uh, tutoplast, which is a fasciolata, and he also used uh, pelvicol or pelvicol or soft. Now, what it did show is that uh, at five years, the mesh culpopexy did have superior results anatomically compared to the fasciolata. But at one year, the fasciolata and the acellular porcine dermis was equal in regards to outcomes. Now, remember the porcine dermis, this uh, pelvic 
soft was actually uh, cross-linked and consequently it really doesn't provide much degrading to that. So we'll have to see. This is once again very, very low quality evidence, but I don't know if that will change. Now something here, we've got Peter Sand who's on uh, the, the discussion today. He and Roger uh, actually did a great study that was looking at transvaginal mesh uphold compared to cadaveric dermis using axis or repliform. They looked at it at one year, similar to the standard uh, study that we look at is a composite. And what you can see here is that one year, the dermal graph was inferior to the transvaginal mesh. It was inferior in all the different categories, whether you looked at greater than stage two prolapse, the composite failure, and it's intriguing in this regard. Uh, what was done here as far as it, this actually was using OPDS suture through the sacral uh, spinous ligament. There was also attachments at the ischial spine along the arcus tenius fascia pelvis. So this was to an anatomical uh, support in that area. So ending how things are here, I think we do have limited randomized controlled trials looking at biological grafts to native tissue. A lot of the grafts are unfortunately not on the market because they were labeled as class two, all our xenografts are gone. But remember, the studies are very heterogeneous and it depends on the type of graft material used, the surgical approach and what points you are actually attaching it. So how I would say it in the anterior compartment, I think that there probably is some benefit choosing it to the right patient for the right indication. In the posterior compartment, I don't think that biological grafts are really beneficial. And I think the apical compartment is just too early to tell. We don't have enough evidence. Clearly, larger randomized control trials are needed, and hopefully, we'll start to get those in the future. You know, in female pelvic medicine, we've gone through a lot of changes. 2010, there was just a heyday. There was a lot of companies that were involved. We had all sorts of biologics. Every company had a biologic. We had all sorts of meshes available. Fast forward to 2020, we now only have sacral complexy mesh, and we only have really one company with the biologic staying compared to 2010. So the hope is that we're gonna get improvement over time. And you know, I think that time will tell, but I'll end it here, Amanda. I look forward to the discussions we have with our distinguished panel. So Amanda, I'll uh, pass this back over to you. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Kanelli, for such a, a really excellent and thorough presentation on graphs. Um, I'll now present two hypothetical case scenarios, um, kind of concept review um, for the panelists to discuss. And just as a reminder, um, please submit your questions through the Q&A section, um, and we'll address questions um, after the panel discussion. I'm just going to reshare my screen. All right. Um, so the first case, um, basically, as a patient um, with a prior synthetic um, mesh in the um, anterior compartment, um, they had a mesh excision due to an erosion, um, and now they represent with recurrent um, symptomatic anterior and apical prolapse desiring surgical repair. Um, the questions regarding this case would be, um, when would you consider a biologic graft for anterior apical prolapse, um, and what graft options are available for repair of recurrent prolapse? And feel free, whoever would like to answer. Um, well, thanks, Amanda. I, I guess I'll take a first stab at it, um, and then I'll, I'll kick it over to Peter. First of all, I want to just thank Dr. Canelli for doing a phenomenal job of really encapsulating everything that we kind of really know about synthetics and starting to learn about biologics. And very often, that you know, the devil is in the details. The first thing with this patient, you know, a couple of things I'd want to know more about the patient, such as age, and is it an abdomen I want to be in, or is it an abdomen I want to stay out of? Also, when patients have had a problem with a synthetic mesh, and they're very anti-synthetic mesh, you know, again, because of that, and that may, may limit you know, your options about um, using a synthetic. So it, the two things I was thinking about is a the more demographic and you know detailed granular information about the patient age risk factors recurrence prior abdominal surgeries do i want to stay vaginal 
do I, is abdominal an option and how does the patient really feel about repeat synthetic use? When I talk to our patients now about augmentation, um, one of my mantras is that um, native tissue repair with absorbable sutures is destined for failure. We now have well established evidence-based medicine by the optimal trial that over time, it really isn't a surgery that you'd want to hang your hat on, whether it's two years or five years. So we need to augment our repairs. And that augmentation comes in both graft <clears throat> and suture material selection. So if we want to stay vaginal in this patient, which is always sort of my go-to, I think there's a lot of advantages to vaginal approaches to reconstruction than transabdominal. Um, and so I would offer this patient, you know, a transvaginal approach. As we all know, you know, vaginal walls don't move up and down like elevators. Um, they sort of swing down or swing up like trap doors to the attic or the basement. So um, there's usually an apical component. So this patient's, you know, recurrence, so I always talk about detachment versus distension. I've always gravitated towards synthetics pound for pound. I talk to my patients that they're a stronger, more durable material for augmentation, um, but they do come at a higher risk of adverse events, as, as Mike talked about. So I would lean, you know, towards a vaginal approach. Um, I would imagine this recurrent anterior defect has a detachment element to it, both apical detachment and some lateral detachment. And so I would offer a biologic graft, um, and I would then augment that vagin that biologic graft with synthetic material. So what I talk to patients about is that the real biomechanical loading is the bridging, for lack of a better word, between the muscular, fibromuscular tube of the vagina and the, and the perimeter of the pelvis. And so whether you have, you know, Delancey has taught us, you know, again and again, what is the anatomical um, basis for those um, um, support systems? And then his recent talking about looking at mechanisms of action for failure and why that it happens and looking at what happens around the perimeter of the vagina versus within the central distension. So I would go with a biologic graft and I reinforce the biologic graft with permanent sutures that run from the sacrospinous ligament all the way towards the cervix and or the vaginal apex. So as you know, I, I gave you a, a, um, a, a drawing that Peter Sand took liberty of making fun of before we all get on this thing, but if you, can, if you can go to that graph now, and Peter, please don't make any you know, degenerative remarks about my drawings, but that amoeboid that could either infect your mind and suck out your brains or be a guide to surgery um, what I'm trying to show there is the arms of the graft have proline sutures running through the arm. So I am creating suture bridging. And it always sounds like that's a bad word. I really don't think it really necessarily is. Um, and again, we have some data that we've developed the last year, year and a half. So it was Easter weekend where I got the FDA notification. And that, that Easter weekend, I was then sketching on a napkin, actually, what I would do on Monday morning on all the vaginal surgeries I had that couldn't put my mesh in them. So what you see in this diagram is proximally, you see the Y arms of um, the Axe axis graft. You can see that there's um, a proline suture that is weaved, for lack of a better word, through the arm um, and then in, in sort of um, placing a suture through the cervical stroma. Some of the red circles that you see there are we've learned that it's really surgically challenging to bring a Mayo needle through a dermis. You can, you know, wrestle with it, curse a lot, which is my, my go-to club on that. But if you pre-punch those holes with an angiocath, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so we can actually not curse and, and get it through a little easier. The trick here, it, you know, it looks a little macrame. That, you get over that pretty easily. But you're actually tying down, so that you're not, you're not tying down to the sacrospinous ligament. You're, you're tying up to normal anatomical position of the cervix. And you need to avoid over-tying one side or the other to get sort of normal anatomical restoration. Um, th this developed out of a sort of a thought I had of um, combining a surgical approach to um, – uh, and prolapse, you know, incomplete uterine prolapse in, in a percutaneous suturing technique um, and that I've been exposed to the last year, to, you know, so we talk more if you want, called in place. Pretty impressed with that. A lot of, um, a lot of surgical challenges with it 
um, but sort of love hate at the person at the present moment. But I sort of took the concepts of that permanent suture bridging and put that in with a biologic graph for the regenerative things, the scaffolding that Mike talked. So what I'm trying to hope the really chain you know, accomplish is when Mike showed those that bimodal graph in the in the gap in the middle, that those permanent sutures provide that bridging until tissue remodeling happens. So that's what we've been doing. That's probably why I would offer this lady, you know, without all the granular stuff I asked about. And obviously you can approach her abdominally. Um, and that's with my approach. So I'm, I'm eager to hear what, what Peter would do. So let me just uh, break in for one second because I do want to hear Peter's comment. <clears throat> I think it is important that proline suture is utilized to the sacred spinous ligament. And the reason being is that depending on your graft material you're using, I think if you're using a SIS or a urinary bladder, I don't, that's going to go away. The scaffolding won't be there for a long period of time. But if you're using something that's going to be there for a long time, you have to wait and see. PDS sutures are, you know, for six months. And I think Peter, during your hysteropexy area, I love that you were doing it anatomically, but it was PDS suture. And I've just wondered if that was a component to things. So I'll let you answer the question first, but then come back to that. Okay, well, it, let me answer your question, Mike, first, just quickly. So for two decades, I used permanent sutures to do sacrospinous vaginal wall suspensions. And to be fair, a lot of those were with a uh, type two uh, suture, not mesh as it were, but using Gore-Tex. But even with using proline suture, it has been no fun over the course of my career to dig out these sutures when they spit through the vaginal wall, which we know will occur in, with these sutures in about one to 2% of cases. And uh, we've also published uh, one case and had another case of a lovely uh, cutaneous out to the buttocks uh, <laughs> uh, tract, uh, fistula tract, fistula, fistula and ano. So I stopped using permanent sutures, I believe it was seven years ago. So and the comment I, right there is that the one thing regarding biologics though, if one of the permanent sutures like what Vince has on the drawing here, it's well below. You're not bringing it at all through the vaginal mucosa. So right. that's why I stated, if you do a second PDS suture, then you can take it through and through like you would your sacrospinous. Exactly, you can. Uh, but I must admit that, uh, and, and that was something Dave Nichols used to do decades ago when he was alive and, and published in his textbook on vaginal surgery. And Dave said he would use a permanent suture for strength and chromic to incite an inflammatory response to get this tissue to scar. And I do not have any data on suture choices here in apical suspensions, to be fair, just the complications. And I have not noticed in my experience of following people that we've had any fall off in anatomic success. Your point is valid. You, you, For the fellows, you may not think about it at first, but you don't want to bring a permanent suture through and through the vaginal wall and tie it in the vagina, especially if it's uh, not a monofilament. If it's a multifilament suture, it can act as a wick and things can get quite nasty quite quick with a transvaginal infection. But, <laughs> Uh, going back to the case, uh, this is the ideal spot in my mind to use a biologic graft. And <clears throat> nowadays, and, and Mike showed you a paper looking at hysteropexy data comparing uphold or polypropylene mesh hysteropexy to using an arcus to arcus dermal, human dermal graft that we anchor in three spots on the arcus on either side and back to the sacrospinous ligament bilaterally also. So we have eight points of fixation of the graft and to Mike's caution, uh, well, I'm sorry, th this was actually Vince's point. Distally, we don't use PDS, which we use everywhere else. We just use Vicryl and we make sure we don't make it too tight across bladder and neck. It's important to avoid retention. But in, in the paper by Letko et al. from our center, just looking at vaginal vault suspension, we showed no difference. Statistically, numerically, there was a difference where uphold was slightly better, uh, but there was no statistically significant difference. 
And I think the average follow-up was close to a year in that, in that cohort. So I think it's a great way to do it. But Mike did show you a paper that we published years ago, and we started looking at this 24 years ago at using adjuvant crafts. And the second paper we did, uh, we used the fascial patch, and you saw that article referenced in his slide. And what we learned during that was a very interesting experience. We thought that the two by four centimeter fascial patch that we cut and anchored just to connective tissue in the area, we thought it reduced the risk of recurrent cystocele significantly. But when we did a linear regression analysis of all the other factors involved, we found that suspending the apex by doing a bilateral sacrospinous vaginal vault suspension and putting in a bladder neck sling at the level of the bladder neck was really what worked so well. And doing that without any mesh underneath the bladder base at one year led to a 2% failure rate. Only 2% of people had recurrences to the hymenal ring. So when we think about adjuvant grafts and we need adjuvant grafts, I always think back to that. If you're afraid and you don't wanna use a full graph like I do now using the axis graph, Arcus to Arcus, the other thing you can consider is the very first prospective randomized control trial that we did in the world's literature. And we just took absorbable synthetic mesh, vicral mesh or polyglactin 910 mesh is the proper term. And we stuffed it into our anterior coporophy. So where you imbricate the anterior vaginal wall when you do a normal anterior coporophy, we just stuffed some vicral mesh in that space and reduced the risk of recurrence in the anterior compartment by 50%. To Vince's point, and Mike reiterated this too, we probably would have done a lot better if we had done apical suspensions in all of those patients. I just want to follow up with what Peter said is that if you're, you know, two things. One, just general mantra, if you want a permanent result, you know, I gravitate towards permanent materials, but they always come at a price. You have to be super careful when you use them. And actually, if you can see in my, you know, pathetic drawing here, is that um, it's a full thickness dissection so that you are you have these permanent materials behind all four histological layers of the vagina. And that's always been our approach from the get-go. When we first went down this road of permanent synthetic materials transvaginally delivered for prolapse, is that we wanted to anatomically place these synthetic materials in the same location they would be if you delivered them to the pelvis abdominally. So if you come in abdominally, you tag your it, you're automatically behind all those layers, right? You, you don't have to do any dissection through the vagina to get there. So that was always, you know, sort of a huge benefit for delivery of transabdominal. Transvaginal, much different. You had to dissect all the way through those layers to get to those true spaces. Not easy. Um, um, it, it's not super hard, but you had to have a good technique to do that. And that was where we really stubbed our toes. So the Cochrane review, if you drill that down, and I've done that, and you look at, you know, the price you pay for using, um, you know, synthetic meshes, and they break that down to reoperation, and you know, and it, the, the lion's share of that, the elephant in the room, is exposures. And if you drill down exposures and start looking at patient factor, mesh factor, um, and surgeon factor, it's glaringly, glaringly surgeon factor. And, and so we really had a dissection problem. And so that I think carries over to even using any augmentation is that dissection does matter. You're going to stack the deck in your favor, um, whether it's spitting sutures or even tissue remodeling that are augmentation or materials are up against the fibromuscular serosal layer and not sub epithelial. If you're sub epithelial, you know, you're really not going to have optimization and you can, you know, I think decrease the success rates and increase adverse events. Um, so I'm still a full thickness guy, even though I'm now using biologics that are turbocharged um, with you know permanent sutures in the mechanical loaded aspect, which is the bridging or the um, Delancey talks about it too, suspension at level one, right? There's a distance between the vagina and the pelvic sidewall. And when you're going to span that that distance, you, you need to have a permanent um, element to your to your augmentation. Or I think, you know, and to Peter's point and all of our challenges is that, you know, 
we have data one year, two year, three year, and patients are obviously going to live, you know, live, you know, very live, you know, live, you know, active lives for 10, 15 years. So we really got to think much more long, long term and, and, and try to gravitate, and gravitate towards some element of permanency uh, with your, you know, with your, your material choices when grafting. Hey Vince, let me play. Let me play devil's advocate real quickly. Go ahead. Just just be careful for the fellows out there. If you start to do full thickness repairs, like Vince talking about, there is a learning curve. And in the original series, I believe the rate of cystotomy was 2%, if I'm recalling properly. Yes. So when I looked at those data, Vince, no, no offense, I'm a chicken. And I was like, I don't <laughs> want to do something where I'm making a hole in the bladder 2% of the time. Forget it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There, there's a learning curve. And, um, and you know, again, at another forum, we can talk more about how to bring that down to near zero, but it'll never be zero. It'll never be zero. Um, but you're right. It, it's, it, it does have a, um, a learning curve and, and, the, you know, and again, a challenge with surgical execution. All right, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, we have a question that I think can be asked fairly quickly um, and uh, answered fairly quickly. Um, there, the question is that um, with the axis dermis mesh, which side of the mesh should be placed against the endopelvic fascia and which side should be placed against the vaginal epithelium? Right, so the one thing when you're using the tissue is you wanna actually put it in blood. If you drop blood on it, the blood will absorb into the dermal side. If it's on the base membrane side, it just sort of washes off. So with that, remember, prior to putting these in, I would actually, if you have any bleeding during the time, I would soak it in blood because you're already preloading it with the patient's cells to start the process. And for me, I would put the, the dermal side actually uh, against the, the, the bladder side, the pubocervical fascia, and I would use the base membrane against the vaginal epithelium. The vaginal epithelium doesn't have a whole lot of vascularity going into it to feed into the scaffold. So that's that's what I do. I agree. Well, um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Canelli for his wonderful presentation. I'd also like to thank our, our panelists, um, Drs. Lucente and uh, San, for a great discussion answering um, our questions. Um, and then once again, I just want to thank OGS, SGS, and SUFU uh, for putting this informative webinar um, together during this difficult time. Um, just a reminder about next week's webinar, it's the Surgical Treatment of Stress Urinary Incontinence with the guest speaker, uh, Dr. Mickey Graham, and panelists, uh, Roger Dimachowski um, and John. On Gebhardt. Um, that will be Tuesday, June 9th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, just of note, uh, the final webinar will be the following Tuesday on the 16th. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Um, and if you can't watch the live broadcast, um, you can search it on YouTube or you can find it on the Society's websites. Um, on YouTube, you just search for Augs Fellow Lectures. Um, thank you guys so much um, and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Good night. Great job.